Welcome everyone to day three of our Human Rights Brief Symposium, um, Understanding uh, Police Violence at Home and Abroad. Um, to introduce uh, the symposium and the Human Rights Brief, I would like to welcome and introduce uh, the Faculty Director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, Professor Macarena Saez. Thank you very much and welcome to the fourth day of the Symposium on Police Brutality organized by the Human Rights Brief. I can't um, really express how proud I am, not only about the brief coming up with this wonderful idea, but organizing such an incredible uh, conversation that has been going on and it will end tomorrow, but it will end only the conversation, this part of the conversation, because this is an ongoing conversation. Um, today's uh, uh, specific focus will be on, on the role of colonization and migration in police brutality in Europe. And I'll say a little bit uh, more about that uh, later, but I wanted to first uh, tell you a little bit more about the Human Rights Brief and the Center for Human Rights. The center is, as, um, this is our 30th year anniversary, so we are an old institution within the, um, the school, and that I think shows our commitment to human rights from, from a early stages of legal education. And the brief was founded in 1994 um, as part of the Center for Human Rights. And it uh, was founded as a space for practitioners and scholars and students to discuss current human rights issues and standards in a more flexible and fast paced format than the traditional law journals, but with the same intellectual rigor. The brief reaches more than 4,000 subscribers, reaches more than 130 countries, and it publishes pieces written by practitioners around the world, as well as short pieces written by our own students. Every year has the brief um, has around 50 students working and between editors and different sections, writers, junior writers, and it covers a really broad range of issues from children's rights, LGBT rights, disability rights, environmental rights, migrants, refugee rights, etc. Um, and I think that the role of the brief, just as the role of the center, is to build that bridge between civil society and academia and facilitate exchange of ideas that can contribute to actual impactful changes in pressing areas such as uh, police brutality and, and the role of, of police um, uh, forces around the world. And this symposium reflects that intersection between the world of practice and the world of ideas. And it reflects our commitment and this, the commitment of our students to using the law to affect change. And um, I always repeat myself saying this, but I think it's so important that one of the main differences between academia and activism is the role of time in the construction of arguments and the need for action. And while academia has time and it takes its time to think about different issues, um, activism doesn't have that, that possibility, it doesn't have the privilege of time. Activism has a sense of urgency that academia doesn't really uh, have. And at WCL, I always uh, say that we have a little bit of a different idea about academia and activism. We really believe in academia with a little more, more sense of urgency and an activism that will take a little bit more time to uh, find sound arguments and strategies. And uh, I, I think that the role of the brief is precisely to provide that space for that intersection between theory and practice through their publications and facilitating conversations like the one that we are having today, like we're, they're having, we're having this whole week. Um, at the center, we work with students, with faculty, with human rights communities around the world to create opportunities for intellectual development and, um, and, and the uh, engagement with activism through trainings, outreach, workshops, conferences, research and publication. We work on different areas um, in impact litigation, anti-torture, uh, human rights education, um, business and human rights, disability rights, etc. And in each initiative, we involve students, we involve faculty. And for those of you who are um, with us today uh, through Zoom, which is so impersonal and I'm so sad that I can't see your faces, and I can't really make eye contact with you, but I, uh, for those of you who are today in this conversation, who come from uh, the outside world from academia, I wanna tell you that we work with you as well. And that I hope that you will continue working with us, that you will uh, look uh, every time you have an opportunity, you will think of our incredible students and, um, and, and think about engaging them in your work. 
the topic of this symposium is, is so relevant and I really love that, they, that the brief decided to take a global look at police brutality. It's no, um, it's, I think it's an uncontested issue that the US has a serious problem on police brutality tied to racism. People of color, especially black men, suffer at the hands of police at disproportionate higher numbers than white police, that one white people. But this trend also repeats around the world and every country has their own marginalized communities that suffer disproportionately the police brutality. And we need to look at the common thread of how marginalization is constructed and the problem on how we can contribute to, to each country to look at these problems from within. I think that uh, Professor, Professor Angela Davis said something very important on Monday when she, in, in, the, in the first day of this symposium, when she said that police is instructed to use force. That's what police do. But police should be the space, and maybe we should even change the name, but police should be that build that the breach or, or the, it's the first phase that people have in terms of their um, encountering our legal systems. And if we think that law should be protecting individuals, should be protecting rights, that's the phase that police should give, the idea of protection of rights. But for many people, police is the phase of violation of rights. And I think that we can understand and, and identify who are our marginalized individuals by the impact that they have or how they face their encounters with police. You know, some people will feel protected when they see a police officer, some others will feel real fear. And that I think is a divide between those people who are privileged in their societies, who have their rights protected, and those who are marginalized and who we have failed as society. So I welcome today this uh, conversation about colonization and immigration and how those have impacted police brutality in Europe. Thank you very much and I look forward to this conversation. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Saez, for that wonderful introduction. My name is Nur al Mubarak, and I'm the Symposium and Education Editor for the WCL Human Rights Brief. Today's panel is the third installment of the four part speaker series, Symposium Police Brutality at Home and Abroad. The purpose of this symposium is to connect experts, law students, practitioners, professors, activists, community members, and everyone and anyone to learn about the foundations of police brutality in the United States and across the world. In today's panel is focused on Europe and the criminalization of immigrants. We are honored to host Professor Schneider and Professor Rahman. Thank you. Since, Thank you. since the since the early 2010s, we have seen an increase of xenophobia in Europe towards immigrants and refugees. In 2011, France became the first European nation to institute a hijab ban. This began a trend of nationalism and xenophobia in the region. In 2015, the Human Rights Watch strongly urged the European Union to take efforts to facilitate the safe and easy journey of immigrants and asylum seekers, instead of forcing them to take unsafe boat rides in an attempt to reach a stable home. In 2016, almost 3,671 individuals died at sea trying to make it to Europe safely. In 2019, German authorities recorded over 1,600 attacks on refugee communities by right-wing extremists. Once these asylum seekers managed to make it to Europe safely, they still, still continue to have to work through numerous hurdles. From their first steps in their journey to escape violence in their homes, they are met with pushback, xenophobia, and discrimination. When they finally make it to these European nations, they are asked to remove articles of their clothing that are connected to their religious identities. Many of these European nations have strong connections to the home countries of many of these refugees. They colonize most of these na nations, developing some of the unrest in these states, or have had an actress, active interest in the current conflicts. So why are they now over-policing these communities and criminalizing immigration? Experts Schneider and Roman will help us unpack the roots of these conflicts and facilitate the development of unique and sustainable solutions. I will now introduce Caroline Sisson, a first year law student and aspiring civil rights attorney on the symposium team, who will be moderating today's talk. I hope you all enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. We are so lucky to have two experts here with us today.
to discuss the role of immigration and police brutality in Europe. It is my pleasure to introduce them to you. First, we have Kathy Schneider. She is a professor at American University's School of International Service. Professor Schneider teaches and writes on democracy, dictatorship and resistance, collective violence, racial profiling, police violence, and racial and ethnic discrimination in Europe. She is regularly quoted by major media outlets, including the Washington Post and New York Times. And she has spoken on BBC World, CBS, NBC, NPR, and others. Next, we have Edberto Roman. He is a professor of law at Florida International University College of Law. His research deals with the intersection of, on one hand, citizenship law, immigration law, public international law, and constitutional law, and on the other hand, theoretical perspectives based on classical philosophy, neoliberal theory, critical race theory, and post-colonial studies. His first two books on colonialism, citizenship, and nationality have received critical acclaim. So just to let the audience know, we will have a discussion with the panelists until around 1 p.m. Then I will begin to ask questions specifically from the audience. So please use the Q&A function to submit any questions throughout our discussion. Um, so we will not be using the raise hand function. All right, let's begin. Um, starting us off, um, if you can both please discuss your expertise and how it relates to the role of immigration and police brutality in Europe. And we will start with you, um, Professor Schneider. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so, I, my la I wrote a book in 2014 based on over 15 years of research called Police Power and Race Riots um, about the policing of minority communities, which included immigrant communities, but also included native, commu uh, native communities that were labeled immigrant. And so in the United States, I looked at New York specifically, uh, the policing of Blacks and Puerto Ricans, and in Paris, I focused on the suburbs that were called immigrant suburbs, but are largely third generation, um, North Africans, Africans, and the policing of those communities. Um, I also have a long history of doing work on social movements and in response to uh, state violence. I had initially wrote about the resistance to Pinochet in Chile. Um, so, I'm very interested in both how police choose how to respond to different communities, how they have both racial and spatial maps, how they decide that certain communities it is their job to protect and other communities they decide that those communities you have to protect the country from. And so the labeling of communities as part of the nation and a threat to the nation and how that shapes how police interact with those communities and then how those communities respond. Professor Roman. Hi folks, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I enjoyed, uh, uh, if, if, if you don't mind Kathy uh, by the first name for I don't, uh, uh, otherwise I might destroy your last. Uh, people just <laughs> my first class all the time, so I'll take the liberty. Um, I, I would really look forward to hearing more about your subject. Um, from my perspective, I look at these issues um, uh, perhaps a little bit more on the theoretical level, focusing on domestic issues. And the way I would describe it, it's much like uh, in the presentation I gave yesterday to at a, at a different law school, on, on somewhat related issues, but this was a little bit more specific on human trafficking. Um, and I'm I, the way I examine these issues is the looking at it in terms of vulnerable communities um, and the vestiges of vulnerable communities uh, by virtue of historical consequences. And, and, and the key one, and, and kudos to Professor Saez, um, at, at one level, and Anura's comments, at one level, I was really impressed by their comments, but I was also uh, discouraged because they stole a lot of my thunder. Um, so therefore, I have to try to sound like I'm innovative or thoughtful. Um, and you'll let me know if, 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 I, if I achieve in faking that effort. But when I look at these issues, they, they all stem from that. The, the historical consequences that is colonialism, right? In the United States and examine it from everything to in, in, 
specific to our issue, um, such as the Second Amendment, right? And the use of the Second Amendment to weaponize um, efforts to keep people in their place. And the way I examine it in the immigration context and how we've done that to essential workers. I mean, the term has been popularized uh, in the context of the pandemic, but we've had essential workers for well over a century here, um, everywhere, every time since uh, issues related to mining, to uh, to the the inter uh, uh, the the transcontinental railway system um, and and a host of other areas where these important workers that happen to be immigrants uh, were brought in during our our what I call our schizophrenic approach towards immigration when they're needed. Um, either because of their knowledge or, or innovation or their work ethic, frankly. Um, they are quietly accepted, and yet during times of economic or political strife, particularly in war, they're the easy scapegoat. So I examine this group, and I call them repeatedly in, in, in more than one of my books, as the group that are no one's constituents. So therefore, any politician or, or, or law enforcement type, law and order type, because we usually hear it from on high, and the obvious figure that comes to mind should be Donald Trump in that regard. But there were a lot of Donald Trumps before Donald Trump, frankly. Um, it was a reoccurring theme that in many respects was championed by Republicans or conservatives and Democrats towed the line. Uh, um, you know, we, we tend to see them in this context as the saviors, and they're really not. Um, uh, if anything, the Republicans are vicious on these issues um, too often, and Democrats are cowardly. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to either today or tomorrow reading uh, the proposal of comprehensive immigration reform, because it does sound innovative and for a change, um, something that are really substantive. And that's, you know, powerful because, you know, it's coming from a president who I believe is is a straight talker, but doesn't have the best history on, on a criminal law reform. Uh, um, when you think of their prior crime bills and you know his prior statements, particularly in the 1990s. Um, so the, these issues are issues I continue to explore and I look at from not only a domestic, but international. Admittedly, my focus tends to be on the domestic and looking to the South uh, quite a bit, because as I wrote about yesterday in a few blogs on these issues that are center to discussions about who we are as Americans, as people in this world, uh, the Latino and Latina communities are silenced too often. And we're gonna, look, hopefully today we'll examine that a little further with respect to uh, how the vestiges of colonialism, colonialism uh, is affected and it's ongoing in Europe. Thank you for that. So next, could you give us insight into what migrants and refugees are experiencing throughout Europe, um, how they may be treated? Um, would you say they're treated like undocumented immigrants in the United States? And we can start again with Professor Schneider. Uh, so I, there's an expression they use, fortress Europe. So on the one hand, it is extremely hard to get into Europe. Uh, they have, you know, subcontracted the exclusion of refugees and immigrants to third countries. It had been Libya, um, who can you imagine uh, putting, giving Gaddafi charge of keeping Africans and North Africans from getting to Europe, but we also, Hungary, Turkey, all these lovely countries with great human rights records are, be, are used to keep um, refugees and immigrants out. You also have the sea lanes, the Mediterranean being policed and many, many drownings. Um, as uh, Professor Sias mentioned and among those drownings, um, many times there are, they have been um, humanitarian boats going out to save people and some of them have recently been arrested for trying to save people. So the big you know, policy is to keep them out. Once they come in, a place where it's really different from the United States is that the regular police are in charge of looking for undocu undocumented immigrants. It's something that the Arizona law tried to institute in the United States. And they referred specifically to France having done that. Um, so now you have 
immigrant populations, populations with somebody undocumented in their family, um, seeing the police and being terrorized. There was even a case where a undocumented Chinese immigrant saw police enter the neighborhood and jumped out of the roof, uh, uh, dying fear because he so feared deportation back to China. Um, and so people can't ask for help from police. They are, you know, completely vulnerable. They have no police force that can protect them from crime. And that is similar in the United States. But in many cities, sanctuary cities, you can go to the police if you're undocumented and not be referred to ICE. Um, that is not true in, for instance, France, where if you go to the police, you will be arrested, deported for being undocumented. Um, is it better or worse than the United States? It depends when. Uh, U.S. was worse under Trump, arguably. Uh, the, no country since uh, Nazi Germany in France has used a policy of separating children, toddlers, babies from their mothers and their parents. Um, that is, you know, astonishing. Uh, it, it ranks up there with the Argentine military, Uruguayan military, but that a democratic country uh, would be taking babies and having basically concentration camps for children and babies, uh, punishing children to uh, deter immigration, that we don't see in uh, Europe. But we do see these big shanties that are erected. For instance, the most desired country to go to for a long time was Britain, uh, partly because a lot of refugees speak English or had family there. And they would have these encampments in France, um, hoping to eventually get into Britain. Um, and those areas were rife with disease, with um, attacks, with people um, setting fire to um, people's homes. And the French government's decision was to just bulldoze the place. So the situation for refugees is pretty dramatic in Europe and it's not so great for immigrants or children of immigrants either. Thank you. Professor Roman. Yes, I have to uh, agree wholeheartedly with uh, Professor Schneider um, in this respect in examining uh, the, the, the relative countries. So, uh, my shift would be only slight in the, in the sense that uh, in the European context, um, the, the, there is almost this imperial, not in terms of historical context, but in imperial in terms of hierarchy um, to be very quick and and, and supportive in terms of various young communities. When we, when we think about the protests to Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, um, people hitting the streets throughout Europe was quite supportive. And yet by the same token, all right, perhaps not as deadly, all right, not as weaponized. Um, as in the U.S. in terms of the philosophy towards policing, whereas, you know, the, the, the classic example that I talk about in my torts class, for example, is, is stand your ground with respect to the regular citizens. But that's been the philosophy of policing in the United States um, for, for well over a century now in terms of reasonable belief in life being in, on the line to be able to use deadly force. So uh, while in the U.S. Um, we do have that, 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 that mentality that is, again, a vestige of colonialism, um, Europe has it as well. As, uh, but by the same token, in many respects, with this examination that we're looking at in the US is more open. Um, whereas in Europe, I believe it's not only a vestige, it's an ongoing uh, debate that is kind of uh, an undercurrent. It's in the shadows, much like undocumented individuals are. Um, where, for example, in the U.S., you have a, the the Civil Rights Commission or hosts of NGOs and public interest organizations from Latino Justice and AACP, uh, Anti Defamation League, a whole uh, 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 Southern Poverty Law Center that that do open and 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 
cutting right work um, that is quite critical. Um, whereas in Europe, you would have, and doing some of the research this morning uh, to confirm uh, my earlier research on the matter, you have pronouncements and statements that often don't go very far other than saying, oh, we should remember that we have these issues as well. And then when we think of, right, the example Professor Schneider raised in terms of Syria, right, and Professor Saez, and I believe Nuda raised it as well, um, th that is not a vestige, right? That is an ongoing uh, calamity um, that we are dealing with, not only in terms of political strife, but also economic, right, that is throughout North Africa has led to a refugee issue. And whereas in the United States, some of these debates and some of the actions have been horrific in terms of family separation. I couldn't agree more. It reminds me, frankly, of a, of a talk I gave earlier this week and on human trafficking, as I mentioned before. And I had a student, a student at another school ask me, uh, what is ICE doing? Um, to help, right, um, the humanitarian effort. And I thought it was a very sophisticated and humorous comment because I thought it was tongue in cheek. Um, because when I think of ICE and I think of the rage, uh, the last thing I think about is this humanitarian approach. So where I have this, the, have this uh, on the one hand, weaponized approach that leads to kind of horrific results in many instances with respect to policing, um, particularly with respect to the killings. Um, in, it, the philosophy is different in Europe. This is where the double-edged sword comes in, in terms of the, the deadly force, but in terms of targeting, right? In terms of profiling, in terms of using of anything, looking at France, for example, uh, looking at tear gas and rubber bullets to, to quell protests uh, in the past, it's still ongoing. Yet we don't have nearly the amount of, of debate and discussion that we have in the US uh, with respect to these issues. Uh, uh, you're hard pressed to find outside of particular groups that are examining these issues, uh, that are commissions, um, that, are, that even address them, um, finding data finding raw statistics. Um, and you can look to various sites. You can, you can have reports by, the, by countries such as the US, as well as the Philippines, uh, Venezuela, among a host of others. In Europe, in the European Union, it's still problematic to even know the exact numbers. I suspect they may not be as high as some of the countries I raised before. But by the same token, the lack of engagement uh, and, and open disclosure is problematic. And it speaks to again, as I alluded to, kind of an imperial mindset, not only in terms of annexation, but a superiority mindset to say, oh, we, we can protest Breonna Taylor and, and Floyd among a host of others. Um, but is there that self-reflection? So I'll, I'll end there in part because I, 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 um, as I mentioned uh, uh, to the organizers, I have some construction work being done at home. I never know when it's going to get really loud. So I'll, 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 I'll stop. Thank you. How um, how are levels of rising or how are the rising levels of xenophobia and increased alt right movements across Europe affecting this violence towards immigrants who are coming into the region? And Professor Schneider, we'll start with you. Okay, so um, Europe is not uniform, and different countries have different you know different policies in that regard, and different strengths of far-right groups. Um, shockingly, uh, the AFD just entered the parliament in Germany and given its Nazi roots, uh, Germany had been one of the countries that had really kept the uh, far-right out. Um, in France, you know, the National Front is around since 1980. Um, and their impact, they never get off, take office because, except at the local level, because there is this um, sanitary boundary, cordon sanitaire, where parties have uh, traditionally, um, Sarkozy took an exception to that, but in tradition, any time the uh, National Front wins the first round of an election, which they often do, uh, all of the other parties will support the other candidates. So they have kept them out. But what they have also done is adapted their discourse. Um, and I think that we see that much more. So UKIP doesn't win, but Boris Johnson becomes basically UKIP. And in France, we see first 
the far right, but then the left, adapting the discourse, especially on the dangers of foreigners, um, the dangers of anti, it's quite incredible right now in France where uh, Macron's government has not only outlawed uh, the taking pictures of police um, by journalists, but in addition, they have now demonized academics as being responsible for terrorism if they teach things like the impact of colonialism, negative things about colonialism, talk about racial discrimination, they call that an American import. And those academics are endangering the safety of France. Um, one of those academics, Eric Fasson, was threatened with decapitation. Um, and the person who threatened him was arrested and was given a suspended sentence. So um, there is a polarization right now. There is a big discourse on police. And it really began uh, because of the um, Yellow Vests movement and the policing, brutal policing of white folks um, when it was centered in these uh, immigrant suburbs or these uh, minority suburbs, uh, it wasn't visible and it wasn't believed. And it was what provoked uh, most of all of the riots in France, frankly, um, were after police killings. So Europe has, again, variations. Um, North Ireland invented human rights policing. Uh, and there were human rights policing conferences every year for a long time. And the only country that never sent any police was France. Um, so Britain has a lot more training of police to do de-escalation. Uh, Britain has a lot, you know, a history of these unarmed bobbies. Uh, France doesn't have armed local, um, the CRS. It doesn't have armed local police, although I think they've finally, they've been fighting for it and they may have finally gotten it. Um, it does have, you know, the gendarme, which is part of the military, but the gendarme is, it was, is very popular because um, it has military discipline. It addresses people in vu, not tu. It's not uh, it keeps it. It keeps meticulous records. Um, it doesn't have the history of the abuse. The history of the abuse in France is what's called the BAC, the um, Anti Criminality Brigade, which operates without uniforms, like a paramilitary force. And almost all of the killings have been by the BAC, and that is the most hated brigade. Um, Didier Fasson did a brilliant ethnography of that brigade and the levels of racism and xenophobia where they characterize they, you know, populations, North Africans, they're responsible um, for drug running and blacks are responsible for immigrant, bringing in immigrants and they had, and they used open, uh, slurs about these populations and they were never held. One of the things about France is there's never been a conviction of a police officer for killing. Uh, it is in charge of the state. Uh, it's run by the prime minister. Um, the police, the poli I'm sorry, the police is under the um, power of the minister of the interior. Um, everything is occurring not at a private level by the state and police are always given, you know, huge benefit of the doubt, and increasingly, uh, the National Front's discourse about these populations as dangerous and threats, and Islam as a threat. Uh, they are disbanding uh, mosques. They are pushing people into mosques um, recognized or um, organized by the state. Uh, the, you know, the National Front doesn't have to win elections. It has enormous impact in terms of the discourse. Um, a friend of mine who was a lawyer for uh, the EU um, in charge of inspecting jails and policing uh, said that Germany was the best. His, his impression for the same reason that people like the gendarme, they kept meticulous records, they wrote everything that happened, you know, they 
and for that reason, um, you had a lot less abuses. The abuses in the jail system is extraordinary in France, um, including, you know, overt tortures like uh, blow torches to armpits, be making prisoners run through um, a beating. And one of those cases went to the European court for torture. And only then did France investigate it when the European Union was looking at it, the European courts were looking for, at it for torture. But they have records, um, the Committee Against Torture, every year of about 10% of people arrested ending up in hospitals um, for different kinds of beatings. Of course, the torture case is extreme that I, I don't know of other cases except this one that went to the European courts. Um, but it was a common form of policing historically in France of Algerians. Um, and I think you're gonna ask me later about this learning between uh, the policing in France and the policing in the colonies. And that was especially acute between France and Algeria in which techniques used to pacify Algerians were used in the Algeria were used against Algerians in France. Um, I don't, I think maybe I'll wait until you ask me about uh, colonialism more to uh, um, expand on that. Thank you. Professor Roman, if you have any insight. Yes, um, I appreciate the, the comments Professor Schneider made. And once again, I mean, we're not going to have a lot of debate in these uh, circumstances because, they're, you know, they're, they're ones that, that are largely irrefutable um, in terms of approach, in terms of philosophy. But one of the things I want to point out um, is that this, this is not an isolated phenomenon. Right, when we have the arguable leader of the free world uh, uh, taking stances, public and as well as policies, um, that will demonize and torture, frankly, the, the most vulnerable in our society, uh, um, you know, making a mockery of, of the, our ethos as a, as a country of, of immigrants, not only in Europe, but you look at it throughout Latin America. From, uh, from Brazil to Chile to Argentina, um, taking the lead. And, you know, I often wonder um, how history will treat not only Trump, right? I don't think that's going to be, you know, uh, forgive me if I, if I don't re uh, restrain myself here. Um, but in, you know, doing the, the juxtap juxtapositions between Japanese and internment, but let's go even further back with respect to the Americanization movement, right, of the 20th century, um, and how we look at that kind with the same sort of lens that Europe looks at us now. Um, and how could those people be so ignorant in that time to, to, to steal, right, indigenous people, um, their children from them, uh, to make them more uh, uh, acculturated, more American, literally called the Americanization movement. Um, and th these are, are, are cues that are not only we see in Europe, but we see in Italy as well, um, not only in terms of speculation, right, because not that long ago, 60 Minutes, I believe it was, did an expose on Steve Bannon's influence, right, uh, in Europe and in, in, in Italy's uh, pr uh, presidential, equivalent of presidential election, and that populism that, that we associate in, the, in this country with somewhat kind of a romanticized view. You know, I think of populism, I think of McKinley in the, in the prior century, in terms of what he's bringing about the fear of the of the corporation of wealth, um, in terms of that approach, but this the populism we're talking about in, in this day and age is it, it, is a kind of an embrace of ignorance, an embrace of days gone by, an embrace as we as was alluded to a moment ago um, of colonialism, um, whereas in in the US, it's a little bit more in your face. And if I may draw the parallel um, between uh, Nura or, or Caroline and myself um, as a byproduct of the 60s, uh, America, I would look at as, as, as uh, um, are the, our iconic figures in the, in the, in the 1968 uh, uh, Olympics, Juan Carlos and others in, in terms of confronting these issues of being in your face and putting your, uh, the black power sign up, um, not only in terms of African-Americans, but a host of others are exposing these issues. Whereas in Europe, it's kind of an afterthought. Um, and yet we have the same problems. Speaking of, of France, um, where we had redlining in the US and still do, 
from an economic standpoint and a policing standpoint um, in, in, in France and in Europe, it is an effort to uh, not only right, relegate people to another uh, other side or part of Paris in terms of projects and other efforts that people know not to go to, so to speak, the actual so-called French to go to, but it's also a means, right, to, to redline, to, to marginalize, to silence. And I, I, I think it's ongoing and it shouldn't be to no surprise, right? Um, when, I, when I hear Professor Snyder speaking about Germany, um, well, perhaps a reason for that reform is, is the you know, not so pristine past, right? Kind of in your face, the realities of the Third Reich. Whereas um, the rest of Europe that suffers from these issues, um, uh, ongoing issues, again, not in term, not nearly as bad as the U.S. in terms of killings, but by the same token, the abuse of there and the silencing of there, of there, and it's kind of resembles a point I was raising before. Whereas I believe your generation may be smarter than mine in the sense that of incorporating the other, uh, of making you part of yourself. When I think about not seeing commercials of, of an interracial couple versus what I see now and love being a dominant ethos, I believe for many, not all, by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, whereas uh, I, I compare myself and my generation as more the US and kind of in your face. Um, whereas Europe is a bit more clandestine in terms of this, where there's comments and discussions, but the fact that there's, you, you, you're hard pressed to even find data, um, that, that speaks volumes. So, you know, when I think of the regime in the Philippines and, and we have data on, on, on killings, on murders by police and, 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 and uh, military officials and similar data um, is very difficult to find. And it goes to my kind of a, um, what, I, uh, what I call, tell my students, my agnostic approach towards the European Union as basically uh, a, a vehicle for economic development when we think of its creation, right? Um, to be a competitor to, to, the, to the, uh, the, the challenge of America, so to speak. Um, and the human rights and individual civil liberty protections are almost an afterthought. And, and we see that in, in proclamations and statements and investigations that lead not to a great deal of reform. Because when I, when I think of France, for example, the retrenchment of civil rights uh, in, in the examples of Nudere that example Professor Snyder raised, um, they're ongoing. And yet it's the US that really has the problem in the eyes of many. Um, so it, it is the difference between looking at, at, at racial and colonial redress through vehicles like affirmative action versus an assimilationist theory, right? Kind of a pacified theory. And that's why we don't have that data. That's why the dominant discourse is one that silences um, outsiders and don't, don't don't have these vehicles. I mean, I think some of these comments that we're making, and particularly my own here, well, would be problematic for me in terms of my well-being and and security, be it in be it in in Europe versus the U.S. Uh, it's never stopped me. I don't know if I do it. Uh, you know, it's it's easy to sound courageous on Zoom in my home, uh, notwithstanding the construction going in the background. Um, but nevertheless, um, it is it 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 can it's a consistent theme. And how do we address issues of colonialism? How do we address issues of diversity? How we confront them? Whereas I believe the U.S. does it in, in terms of its virtue uh, in, in a forthright and honest way, open way, where confrontation, because of the age of so many groups um, that have coalesced, that, that where we have Trump, we have a reaction to it. Uh, maybe not immediately, but we do. Whereas in Europe, it's kind of the goal. We are all Brits, right? Um, and you know this notion of affirmative action. Why do we need it? Mentality um, and looking and exploring even just that issue. Um, it, and it's far less dramatic or impactful on the individual lives as far as their liberty is at stake. Um, very different philosophies. And again. Um, kind of a talking down approach and a way to mullify right dissent and and 
and, and approach. So, you know, it depends on, on really your, what do you prefer, right? Um, the, the fear of literally driving and being killed, right? Um, I have, you know, five children myself um, and, and two of them look very, very much Latino and the other, my other gringo looking uh, um, boys that are, that are dirty blondes, um, you know, I have a different attitude when they go out um, in terms of these issues. Uh, um, and, and they're cruel to each other, as you might imagine teenagers are, um, you know, um, and I won't, I won't repeat the jokes because they're just so unseemly. Uh, it, it makes me look like bad, like a dad, but you could imagine how simply treat each other between the light skin, right? Yeah, um, that look, one looks like, you know, Caroline and perhaps another one um, looks a far more quote unquote what a Latino is supposed to look like. Um, that's kind of the mentality we have when we juxtapose the, the US versus Europe, um, where the US is, is you, you face a violent and imminent threat of, of your life. Europe perhaps slightly less so um, because of the, the, the weaponization or, or the lack thereof and militarization in the US juxtaposed to Europe. But where Europe does it, does it really confront the issues? Um, time will tell, I likely won't be around. To, to find out the, the overall progress, not just on policing, but on civil rights. Um, in the end, I hope the US, when we, when frankly, the browning of America, which I see as a virtue, um, will force us to perhaps move away from our militarization, our, our, our fixation with the second amendment. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Professor Schneider, you have largely focused on police brutality in France. Um, and France is a party of the United Nations Convention Against Torture. So how do they proceed with these violent policing tactics, although they are a party to these conventions? Uh, the denial. Uh, they refuse to admit that anything is occurring uh, that the police are responsible for. In fact, right now they're accusing people who um, do research um, investigate as you know as helping terrorism uh, so it's it's just the one case that went to the European court where they actually began to prosecute um, but there have been many recent cases Adama Traore they were after his brother they caught him they brought him to the police station and they killed him um, Teo who was sodomized by police in a way like um, Abner Luima so there is an ongoing brutality of the French police against communities. There are a lot of killings um, by the police in France. Um, there are far fewer killings, far, far fewer in Britain, for instance, or in Scandinavia. Uh, France probably has the highest uh, level of police killings. Um, France, you know, like most of Europe has strong gun control which means there's a lot less gun crime and a lot less killing by guns. Um, police don't have, um, regular police don't have guns, but there are killings through strangulation. There are killings, you know, through simply uh, beatings. In, in one notorious case, they chased three young teenagers who were playing soccer and saw the police doing ID checks. And again, this is where the um, ICE and police functions merge. And because they didn't have IDs in there um, on them, they were playing soccer because they were hungry. It was Ramadan, they wanted to go home and eat. They decided to run to avoid the police. And the police saw them and took off after them and cornered them um, in front of an electric power grid. And the kids were so frightened, they looked at the police and they looked at the electric power grid with big signs saying, caution, your life is in danger, um, do not enter, with skulls and crossbones and the kids and barbed wire and the kids looked at the police and they looked at the electric grid and they climbed into the electric grid. And they wandered for 11 minutes uh, in the dark looking for a way out um, until one of the kids, uh, hits the electric uh, power and he was burnt alive immediately. So was the other um, boy holding his hand and the third uh, miraculously escaped because the um, electrocution had created a blackout in the community. Um, and so the third boy 
climbed out and went running down the streets with his smoke coming out of his clothes and burnt all over crying Buna Ziad, his two friends, and ran into Buna's brother. Uh, meanwhile, the police had disappeared and witnesses heard the police uh, call headquarters and said, say, we need headquarters, we need reinforcements to make sure these kids don't get out. And then, oops, they're an electric grid, cancel the reinforcements, their skin isn't worth anything anymore, or, you know, the, which is a literal translation, but in France it's used, they're as good as dead. And they left them. They had 11 minutes to call the power station and turn off the power so the kids wouldn't have died. They were between the ages of 15 and 17. They were loved and well known in the community. People said that they were the kind of kids if you were carrying packages, they would help you. And um, one was, a, Buna was a straight A student. Zayed was the uh, local uh, soccer star. And Sarkozy apologized for his police. There's a long story about how a nonviolent march turned violent when police chased uh, two of the kids ran into a mosque and they shot tear gas into the mosque. All the while Sarkozy saying, Police did nothing wrong. They didn't send shoot tear gas into the mosque. They didn't chase kids into the electric grid. They were hiding in a grid because they were criminals. And it became notorious because the neighborhood exploded, the next door neighborhood exploded. And for three weeks, uh, over 300 towns and suburbs all throughout France were in flames. And the authorities could not stop it until they declared a, a, a nationwide curfew, which hadn't been declared since the Algerian war. Um, so, I'm not sure that you know France has moved away from uh, human rights. France never had human rights for uh, colonial, former colonial subjects, much less for Algerians. And there was another infamous story with the Algerians, uh, October 17, 1961, where the U.S., where France is condemning the U.S. for police violence um, against the civil rights movement, rightfully so. But meanwhile. You know, 40,000 Algerians marched nonviolently against police violence in their communities. And <laughs> Papon, which is a great story about the colonial relationship, Papon, who had been in charge of deporting, administering deporting Jews and resistance fighters uh, during the Nazis, a Nazi collaborator, uh, was cleansed from that history, as many others, by sending them to the colonies to fight um, rebellions for, in Morocco and in Algeria and then bring the tools of the Nazis to these colonies and then back to France. So Papon's the head of the police in France in 1961 and he tells the police, don't hold back. If they're unarmed, act as if they're armed. And they were, they're thought to have killed over 200 people. Uh, France only recognizes, um, I think, 80,000, but um, there are scholars who say 400 uh, people. And it continued after the march. They were tortured to death in police stations. They were hogtied and thrown into the Seine. Uh, they were um, shot during the marches. Uh, they were kept in uh, concentrated areas without food or water. Um, I've interviewed people who have were part of that march um, and were absolutely shocked at the level of brutality. Meanwhile, France is doing same and worse in Algeria. Uh, they had uh, many of the Algerians um, were in turned against France and had believed um, from 1920s on, Algerians had been fighting to, for equal rights in France. Um, many of them, perhaps most of the activists inside the Communist Party, and they gave up and in, um, pushed for independence, but they wanted more autonomy rather than full independence. They still wanted to be part of France until 1945. Many had fought in World War II um, they had been the front lines of both in World War I and World War II, and they had a big victory parade in Algeria, and some Algerians carried banners for free Algeria, and the police attacked them. It led to a riot, and then the police decided to completely destroy Algerian towns throughout uh, 
the area, including burying, pushing people into caves and sealing the caves, burying them alive. And they killed about 30,000. And the Algerians I knew said, you know, that was the point where they couldn't get equal. You know, they knew there was never going to be equal rights in France. There was never going to be equal rights in Algeria. And that was, you know, when the independence movement uh, took over the civil rights movement and uh, Algerians stopped fighting for civil rights. They started fighting for independence. And the big problem then becomes after independence, what happens to Algerians in France? And they are treated as an enemy population and they are continually treated as an enemy population. The North Africans look like, um, Af you know, Algerians, they, they're all the same. And eventually um, Africans start migrating other former colonial subjects and they fall into the same category of exclusion. So when I said, talked at the beginning about how you mark who you protect and who you're protecting people from, um, this markation starts mostly with the Algerians because Algiers and Algeria was considered part of France. It was a district in France. And there was a slate of hands what, how, you know, Algeria was supposed to be like Britannia, but if you were Arab, you had no rights. You had no citizenship, um, supposedly, because you wanted to be under Islamic law. And one part of the things that happened with the conquest of Algeria is the dispossession of people from their farms. And so most of the cities are dominated by the settler population, while in the rural areas, uh, people are dispossessed of their land and they are starving. There's massive starvation, there are no schools, massive illiteracy, the jobs are in France. So there is like an externalized proletariat, Algerians are going to France. France is never making this, made this distinction between the occupation of, you know, of, of Algeria and, you know, colonialism in other countries and those colonial subjects in terms of the rights they were granted in France. They had nominal rights, but no real rights. And it's also important to notice, note that um, because of the structure of the French uh, party system, political parties have to nominate you for you to be a candidate. And Africans, Algerians, North Africans, Arabs never nominated. So they don't have representation. Uh, so the struggle for rights and representation has been very difficult in France and it has resulted in increasing levels of uh, violence in communities where violent groups are not reported because you can't, <laughs> the, the police is your enemy. And so, these very tiny groups um, have engaged in uh, terrorist activities, um, recently uh, attacking police and killing police. Are, am I over time? Should I stop? You're, okay. you're good. I appreciate the insight. Um, now we're going to move to audience questions. Um, so our first question, um, Professor Schneider, you mentioned the concept of Fortress Europe earlier. Could you expand more on the EU's support for local law enforcement and military units in countries like Sudan, Libya, and Algeria? Uh, it's a great question, but I don't know it. The answer, I know uh, uh, Libya. I don't know much about uh, what Europe has been doing in the Sudan. Um, I do know that historically, uh, British recognize, you know, Britain divided the Sudan between um, so supposedly Arab North who had rights and a black South. I know that Libya was the country where people were incarcerated um, waiting for admission into France. And so once you farmed out the protective functions and the argument was that once Europe got rid of borders and people could easily move from country to country um, that you didn't want people to get into Europe because once they got into any European country, they could travel and settle anywhere. So there was a big push to make the border control around Europe and a that if you wanted asylum in Europe, you had to apply from these third countries, countries like, you know, Libya. So I don't know exactly uh, what was going on in the Sudan and the other country. 
Um, I know much more about what happens inside Europe. Thank you. Next question, if Professor Rahman could speak to this. One of the current discussions in the US right now is the need to identify and root out right wing extremists in law enforcement and the military. To what extent are countries in the EU having similar conversations? I think they're, they're having the conversations where, whereas in the US, the, I think there is the potential, right? Um, and, and forgive me, I was reading the the chat question, so I thought I was going to get the question on essential workers, uh, but I, I do want to get that one because I don't buy the question. But nevertheless, uh, um, in terms of the U.S., I think there, there are vehicles in place right, uh, to challenge, be it in terms of lawsuits, be it in terms of proposed legislation, be it in terms of, of uh, frankly, representation, right, um, in terms of diversity. Now, this is where your world, right? I, I, I uh, I juxtapose my my generation with uh, Nuda's and, and Caroline's. Um, the look of Congress, right, uh, dramatically different, right. Not only with the uh, what is it, the Mod Squad or whatever it, uh, it's called, right. That is the, the the target by the right, but just in terms of representation of, of women, people of color in in leadership positions. Um, I, I believe it's dramatically different when I. When, when I look at, uh, you know, and it's still woeful, uh, as I tell my, my immigration students, uh, citizenship immigration students, why the revolt of 52% of our society has not occurred, right, vis-a-vis uh, -vis women, um, how, you know, that's the, the most powerful form of hegemony uh, throughout world history, uh, um, and it's still an, an open-ended question. I, I think in the U.S. there's far more vehicles uh, to address it in, in, in systematic ways. Um, do we achieve those goals always? No, but they're again, uh, they're institutionalized in terms of, uh, I, I would argue, democratic when I compare uh, our House versus, you know, the House of Commons or, or other debates in Parliament. Um, I mean, it looks like something out of Harry Potter, frankly. Um, so that lack of representation and the silencing of, of, of so many groups, uh, North Africans and, and others, right? I, I think of France in particular with respect to that. And I ju juxtapose that with my own community um, here in South Florida and Miramar that is largely uh, run by uh, 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 Caribbeans uh, of Haiti, Domin uh, uh, of uh, Dominica and a host of other uh, countries. Uh, that are representative of the community, but not by by any chance uh, 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 a majority of that community. Uh, so it's much more, I believe, engaged and institutionalized to challenge and question. And 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 it goes to my frankly my cynicism vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the European Union itself as an arm of of economic development and mobility. Whereas, um, and you know, and and, and again, my. Um, my colleague, who I, 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 I've, I've invited both classes, he teaches one version of international law, and he's a, mem he's a member of the ICC, so he has a very different philosophy, and I, a, as an agnostic, really challenge these vehicles as, as really having any teeth or substance, and I think, you know, Professor Snyder, I could listen to you all day in terms of those uh, vivid examples of, of what's going on, and I'd be fascinating to hear more about uh, what happened in terms of the upshot uh, of those uh, instruments, whereas in the U.S., we, we do have, right, cyclical reaction. We do have Trump, but hopefully, right, our institutions um, will come around. Now, I'm not, I'm not confident vis-a-vis -vis international law with respect to that, because there again, I'm, I'm an agnostic, um, and the recent Supreme Court decisions vis-a-vis -vis the, the implication of international law. But I think there are domestic vehicles in the U.S. that are not uh, as ingrained, in part because of, uh, I think, 1960s, for lack of a better way to describe it, in your face, individualized right engagement, right? Um, not only in terms of people, but also instruments, right? The Civil Rights Acts and a host of other measures that provided avenues to at least seek redress. Whereas I find too often in Europe uh, more platitudes in, and, and, and pronouncements by in too many institutions like, like the Civil Rights Commission, or to which I applaud in terms of their statements, but how much they get done is a real question mark. I see the bulk of the European Union in that light. Thank you. So next question, we'll start with Professor Schneider. Why are immigrants either put on a pedestal as essential or a scapegoat as the problem? Why is the narrative so binary and yet so dehumanizing? 
So the narrative of immigration is different in France than it is in the United States. The United States always had this history of calling itself an immigrant nation. And I would say it was a political battle um, between those who demonized immigrants and those who represented immigrants. Um, but I really want to talk about, you know, we're talking about Europe, but uh, it, the French story in the 1920s, France had as many immigrants as the United States. The United States um, Democrats started talking about themselves as an immigrant nation. You know, FDR was very um, represent, you know, represented largely these immigrant communities, worker communities. In France, they had this notion of assimilation that you had to become France, French. Um, and the way in which you became France is that you applied through legal channels, you were brought to France, France needed immigrants desperately. It had lost over a million men during uh, World War I and it needed to resupply labor. And there were two vehicles, the Europeans came in, they were dispersed, they were you know, integrated and they would become French. And so Sarkozy, whose grandparents were from Hungar Hungary, um, which, uh, you know, Le Pen from the National Front said Sarkozy should be president of Hungary, not France. Um, but, you know, uh, Manuel Valls from Spain, very common, very integrated, very assimilated, very different um, attitude towards immigrants from the colonies. Um, so one of the interesting things about France as compared to some other nations, so some nations have this long history where we're really not talking about immigrants. We really are talking about third generation, um, but immigrants are code word. So race doesn't exist in France. So you don't talk about Arab communities. You don't talk about black communities. You call them immigrant communities. Um, but France hasn't had barely any immigration since 1975 at Captain. So other than undocumented immigrants, it's a very limited amount of people who can come through legal channels in France. But until 1975, they were being brought in what they were calling savage immigration. They were being brought in for labor, to serve labor purposes. And as I mentioned, in the colonies, they were starving and destitute, and there were no um, opportunities for in Algeria, Arab workers, you know, if there were workers, they were the settler colony. Um, so they were brought in to do work and they were underpaid, they were mistreated and they were put in these, um, sh you know, areas in the, near the factories, in the outskirts. And initially they had created all these shanty towns. At one point, uh, during the Algerian war, it was decided that the shanty towns were too impenetrable and that the FLN could organize in them. So they started putting up these immigrant hostels and then these HLMs, um, again, apart from the population. It's not really an immigrant population. It is a colonial subject population that are labeled immigrants. And so when somebody is a child of a Swedish immigrant, they are French. And so we do not really talk about immigration. The, you know, the immigrants is a code word for people, you know, former colonial subjects, principally Blacks and Arabs. Um, and there is not a celebration of immigration in terms of multiculturalism. There's a celebration of assimilation that immigrants become French. And then there's also this crazy argument that, uh, you know, Ar Arabs, Muslims don't want to become French. They reject French values. Every survey has found that's not true. They're French. I know French Muslims went back, you know, to visit the countries of their parents or grandparents and felt completely alienated. You know, the country, those countries were so, um, you know, machista, they didn't feel comfortable. It's an, a French version of Islam. They, they want to be France, French, but they've been excluded from assimilation. So the problem is in France trying to assimilate them. It's brutal exclusion, discrimination, um, discrimination at every level. They have sent out these SOS, um, racism has sent out these testers and they apply for jobs or for housing or for um, 
admission into nightclubs or restaurants and always one is white French and one is either black or Arab and always massive discrimination they find. Um, but France, of course, doesn't keep statistics on race because so-called race doesn't exist. And right now, even talking about racism is an American import because race doesn't exist in France. And so it's a strange amalgam. Now, other countries, I don't know of any country in Europe that celebrates immigration. Um, it, it is the immigrants, especially now, the discourse on immigrants is always as a threat Britain, it was the main argument for Brexit. Why did Britain want to leave the European Union? Because they were forced to take in immigrants because immigrants who came into uh, Europe uh, could settle in other co any country and no country could deny uh, them once they were admitted into a European country. So I, you know, it's America who likes to celebrate its immigrant past. And that doesn't mean these countries don't have an immigrant past, but they are very defined by their national culture. And so a strong emphasis on assimilation, unless, you know, you are a former colonial subject where your job there is to work. Professor Roman, if you have any thoughts. Yes, to yes, I appreciate it. That, that was the, the question I was itching <laughs> for. Um, it, I, I think it's a, it's a good question, but uh, um, unfortunately, I, you know, if I was degraded, it would it would need a rewrite um, uh, because half of it uh, 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 suffers from a misconception, uh, perhaps in the virtual halls of uh, American University and other academic circles, we have that binary. Um, uh, I would venture to say you find uh, uh, prior to 2013 or so, having the media throughout the United States in any locale, even now the so-called liberal CNN, um, speak to immigrants um, in this essential, that's a term I used, right, uh, in this presentation, but it's not part of the dominant narrative. Um, uh, until the last perhaps 10 years where it started to creep in to the discussion. When we think about it, not only in terms of, right, uh, Republicans and Donald Trump, he's the easy target, but, you know, um, think of the, the, the new savior of the Republican Party, perhaps, in for, my prediction is in just under four years, Mitt Romney will be the candidate. Um, he ran on self-deportation. Right. Uh, in terms of opposition to immigration reform, uh, someone that I spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours volunteering for, Hillary Clinton, was not a supporter of comprehensive immigration reform and refused to take stances on the treatment and the narrative associated with immigrants, kind of the classic, my apologies, the noise in the background, I don't know if you can hear it, I, I got to think you can. Um, they evidently uh, disagree uh, with me, but more importantly, um, the Democrats are cowardly with respect to those issues. So I don't believe that binary by any stretch of the imagination is part of dominant discourse, let alone it being dehumanizing. Fact of the matter is that very few examine the actual data and facts related to the impact of immigrants. My work does, not to plug my own book with respect to that, so I won't do it, part of me saying, please do. But I, I you know, thus far I've had about uh, a few dozen of dollars in, in royalties with respect to it. But you look at study after study from liberal, from government, from conservative uh, institutes and think tanks like the Cato Institute, speaking to the impact of immigrants on our society, documented and undocumented, but particularly undocumented, billions of dollars in added benefits that they provide. That is not part of, name me the candidate, right? That goes out there, maybe AOC has alluded to it. Maybe Biden has made reference passing and maybe we'll hear about it today when the bill evidently is maybe before us right now um, as we speak. But the dominant narrative isn't that binary isn't the binary that is alluded to in the question. So I reject that argument. Hopefully over time, that'll be the change and we can ask that question 10 or 20 years from now. Um, and it is only when, right? And the value that I hold hand in hand with my research on, on immigration is the value of diversity, 
diversity in academic circles and journalism and politics when these issues come to light. Because prior to that, right, when, when there were women, people of color, and also other groups, and perhaps not describe that as, as, as such, but allies, historical allies like the Jewish community um, in terms of these issues. When these issues were brought to light in the in the context of the binary uh, civil rights uh, debates of the 60s, where the, there's even that discussion. But we are we are, we are not light years away, but we're decades away from that binary. So I reject it wholeheartedly. Um, and the second point I wanted to make is that uh, Professor Snyder highlights the point that I alluded to, and Professor, uh, I suspect Professor Saez alluded to, and, and Nura alluded to earlier that kind of assimilationist model that detracts from that honest and open conversation because of the goal is to aspire to be French or, or other, and, and, and France is not alone, right? Because we could, we could reclassify the debate slightly in Germany and look at, at its, its nationalization laws, right? And its historical troubles with citizenship in, in defining who can become a citizen. And, and the, the, to the extent that been inroads, that is basically yesterday that it happened in terms of historical consequence. So they, so, so the U.S. Um, is is that 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 so-called dehumanizing binary is non-existent in my mind, um, and in the context of Europe, it still suffers from that kind of um, you know false consciousness it, it, that that is exemplified for, uh, by assimilation. Thank you both so much for your expertise today. Uh, we only have time for one more question, so. Um, we'll give you guys both time to answer it briefly before we end. So what should we do as future attorneys um, or what should we keep in mind so that our work isn't shaded by roots of colonialism and imperialism? Oh, so I'm not an attorney. Um, and I was, um, I, I, I'm not sure if you're talking about here in the United States internationally or in uh, Europe, but I also wanted to, you know, add something about this assimilation. Um, assimilation worked in France if you were European, and so it wasn't an issue of assimilation not working. It worked great if you were European. You were now French. It was exclusion and discrimination that was a problem. Europe had a different definition. Of, I mean, Germany had a very different de definition of citizenship. Germany's definition of citizenship was based on blood and only recently were they forced to start admitting into citizens people who didn't have Germanic blood. So if you were of German descent from Chile, I know a Chilean family who got German citizenship, you got German citizenship. And if you had been, you know, generations in Germany but you were Turkish, you didn't. Um, however, there is an interesting study that points out that actually um, Turkish children were more represented than French uh, children of colonial subjects uh, who had full citizenship because uh, uh, the labor unions were represented in government and Turkish citizens were, um, I mean, Turkish children who weren't German citizens were active in labor unions that were very, very strong and represented them that way. And I should just go back to, um, while most of the colonial subjects came to fill this labor need, they were expected to go back home. In fact, one, I, one of the um, prime ministers offered them $10,000 to go back home because now there wasn't a labor need. Um, and so there's massive, you know, very high levels of unemployment in those areas now. And the only people who took the $10,000 and went home were uh, the Spanish and the uh, Portuguese because their dictators had just fallen. But going back to what lawyers can do to uh, not uh, reduce this is to recognize that there are two systems of justice in these countries. There are human rights, uh, civil rights, respect for those rights for those of European descent. There is a different set of rights for those, not formally, but in practice, for those who were come from areas where they were colonial subjects, just as in the United States, that is true for former slaves and former colonial subjects such as Puerto Rico and of course, Native Americans, which we never talk about and who were, you know, where there was such a massive genocide uh, that 
you know, the population is now small and on reservations that we never talk about, where they do have a different set of rights. So that's a long answer. And I just wanted to correct something about the uh, headscarves. Uh, they were never made illegal. They were banned from at first schools and then public places. What was made illegal were burqas, but nobody ever wore a burqa. It was purely symbolic. It was a way of um, using anti-Islamic feeling in the legislature. It did affect a few families, but there were like 200 families in France that wore a burqa. But the headscarves had a much bigger impact because um, jobs are largely state jobs in France. And so if you work in the public sector, you're a teacher, you're, you know, I have a friend who uh, has a PhD in international law, um, but she wears a headscarf, can't get a, you know, faculty job. So there are these subtle forms of discrimination in which they don't have to ban the headscarf, they just have to make life really hard for women who use them. Okay, long answer. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor Rahman, we'll give you the last word. We only have a few more minutes here, but if you could speak to our role as attorneys looking ahead. Sure, sure, thank you, I appreciate it. And, it, and it's actually consistent with just about every talk I give um, in, in terms of these issues, because they, they typically, uh, uh, the students or organizers raise these questions. I, I would step back for a moment. I wouldn't say um, as attorneys, I, I would say as law students, as, as young people. Um, to, to examine these issues, to do what you're doing now, right? Um, in, in, in this context, not only in the audience of roughly 40 that are on, online that may have access to it later in terms of a recording, but also to consider engagement, right? Be it uh, in terms of writings um, on these issues, not only in terms of this event, but other events to, to speak to those issues and to remind yourselves who you are. Um, too often, right, when you're, when you're looking at someone behind a podium, right, um, as, as either a gray, uh, 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 an old gray beard like myself, right, male um, authority figure, to view them as some, someone on high, so to speak, um, and fail to recognize too many, fail that you are our clients, you are our customers. Um, and insist on these issues. And this is not a hard sell at, at American, but I, I would speak to the 200 or so other law schools in America, frankly, on this issue to remind yourselves that you are the people with the power, even if it's transitory, even if it's three or four year stretches at a time for the vast majority of you, um, in terms of examining these issues to ensure that these issues are being talked about and discussed, not only in law review articles, uh, perhaps in student newspapers, perhaps in discussions with the hiring of your your next dean with the hiring of future faculty. Because um, as I wrote yesterday um, in looking at, as I mentioned to the group prior to uh, the event starting, I, I, I wrote a blog on, on a couple of different sites on, uh, you know, applauding the, the, the program, the Netflix, uh, Netflix program Amend um, and, and the value of diversity and its importance in terms of who we are. But by the same token, I also criticized them and criticized the academy. Um, because they, they emulated each other, particularly in the context of Latino and Latina um, invisibility, um, to insist that those issues change. Because we don't have these discussions, and people may differ with me with respect to this, but we don't have these discussions without the women's suffrage movement, right? Without the, the, the largely African American civil rights movement in the 1960s with the immigrants' movement in that era and subsequently, to insist that these discussions occurred not only in terms of uh, mindset in perspective, but also in representation, right? To insist that your communities, be it law, because our profession is the greatest in the world in our statements and proclamations from the ABA and the AALS, and, uh, you know, and yet living up to it is an entirely different thing um, in terms of, you know, communities that I could speak to, and I'm a representative of one of 200, but if I look further in terms of my uh, brothers and sisters who happen to be Arab or, or Muslim and, and the dearth of them in, in this profession, um, um, I, you know, it, it, most of them are my friends and, the, and it's, you know, I can count uh, maybe more than, than with two hands, but not much more uh, than that to insist that, that we have these discussions, that these issues come to the fore, to volunteer, to write. Um, always an uphill battle, but again, a byproduct of the 60s, right, in, the, in, the, in terms of the vantage point, um, to continue the ongoing discussion and, and perhaps, right, think about it, not necessarily adopt it, because I'm not 100% sure I'm right if the assimilationist model that I see more with young people, um, it, it, to question it, to question it, right? Um, 
does you know acceptance mean you're no longer right and i love the fact schneider ra uh, raised two issues that i write about not only in terms of indigenous people but i happen to be puerto rican in terms of you know prime example of of the, of the colonial history and 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 in terms of articles, one of my articles called American Colonies, um, the, the, to ensure that these discussions are had and they're in your face with respect to, 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 to engagement and, and forcing the issue um, in terms of maybe assimilation is the right way, maybe a, a, a Frenchman or others will, will convince me otherwise, but in terms of young people, continue to talk about it, write about it, um, insist that it comes to the fore and I applaud you for having this event and related ones. So, you know, American is 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 kind of the the zenith of, or, or 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 the the not wouldn't say ideal, but but close there too in terms of of um, ensuring that at least those perspectives are brought out there. But more and more of you need to you know preach to your friends at Georgetown or or Catholic and and other schools, and also speak to high school students and junior high school students. Engage in street law, which I spent a lot of my life um, doing. Um, you know to work with DACA kids to to help them with and and push your schools to do it because we're great talking about diversity, <laughs> except we're lousy at implementing it. So that, that's what my suggestions are. Thank you, professors. Thank you for your wonderful advice and your excellent commentary. I want to thank our wonderful symposium team, our EICs and Professor Sayas, and thank you for events and captioning for making everything happen. It wouldn't be possible. And thank you for our social media team for posting and uploading. And I'm so excited for our last and final event tomorrow. And I wanna ask you all to stay engaged with us. We do plan on hosting Know Your Rights campaigns through the symposium team on the Human Rights Brief so we can engage with our greater community. And also if you're interested in publishing with the Human Rights Brief, please reach out to chief at hrbrief.org. And thank you all again. This was an excellent, excellent conversation. Thank and it's wonderful to be thank here. Thank you very much. And I just say I'm not pushing for assimilation in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.